students. In this lecture, we're going to talk about Guy Lussac's law and how the pressure of a gas is related to the temperature of a gas. So, if we're wondering what Guy Lussac looked like, here's an approximation. Uh, he was alive in the 1700s and the 1800s, and he was a French chemist and physicist. And he liked to do his research in hot air balloons. And this is where we got Guy Lussac's law. And what he said is that the pressure of a gas at a fixed volume, so the volume isn't changing, is proportional to the temperature of the gas. And of course, the temperature is in Kelvin because in the gas laws, we do our temperature in Kelvin. So this means as the pressure changes, the temperature must be changing, or as the temperature is changing, the pressure must be changing. Either way, you want to think about it. Now, this one is something that's directly proportional. So that means that as one thing increases, so say the temperature increases, that means that the pressure is going to increase also. And if the temperature goes down, the pressure will also be going down. So uh, we can see the direct proportionality there. And if you look over at the picture, what we can see is that if we double the temperature, we're also going to double our pressure. So right there, the diagram shows you the direct proportionality. Now, if we put this into mathematical terms, what we'll get is this equation right here. So we've got P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So what you might notice in the last three laws that we've done, Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, and Guy Lussac's Law, is that V and P are going to be in the top and T is going to be in the bottom. So again, I'll tell you that the math in this chapter isn't that hard. It's just remembering all of the different gas laws and being able to get the right one and remember where the variables go. So if you just remember that the T goes in the bottom, then you'll remember that the other two are in the top. And just in case you're having a day where you don't feel like doing algebra, I have rearranged the equation for all of our variables right there. So what we'll see is that as we increase the flame here, so we're increasing the temperature, what will happen is that the pressure will start to increase. And we can see that on the graph right here. Now you guys are doing a lab for me where you're actually going to do a graph very similar to this. So what we have on this graph is we have pressure on the y-axis. So you guys would write pressure and you'd put a capital P and you probably wouldn't write P again. And then you put your units for pressure in parentheses. So if you've got kilopascal, you'd write kPa. If you had tor, you have T-O-R-R. -R. Or pascal or PSI or millimeters of mercury, whatever your pressure unit is. And on the x-axis, you'll have temperature and you'll want to put a capital T. And then you'll have your temperature unit in parentheses right there and make sure that you have a nice title up here and our title is not pressure versus temperature or temperature versus pressure or T versus P make sure you put a descriptive title so if your reader has no clue what they're looking at once they read the title and look at the axes they can figure out what kind of information you're trying to give them now, notice that all of your data points are going to be up here. So they're going to be in the top right-hand corner of your graph. And the lab asks you guys to extrapolate backwards. So that's exactly what this graph is doing right here. So in case you were wondering what your graph is supposed to look like, it's something like that. Make sure that you guys are using up it 
as much of the graph paper as you can. You don't want to have a tiny little graph in the corner over here because the larger the graph, the easier it is to see. And make sure that you are putting increments that make sense. So you're going to want to go by twos, fives, tens, twenties, hundreds, thousands, things like that. You wouldn't want each box to be 5.5, if at all possible. All right, let's do some problems. So number one says, Jim Bob has revved his engine enough so that the internal temperature and pressure of his engine are 700 K and 200 KPA. If the temperature outside was 295 Kelvin before Jim Bob got in his car, what was the internal pressure of his engine at the 295 Kelvin temp? Well, what we'll notice here is that we've got a temperature because Kelvin is a unit of temperature. And we have a pressure here because KPA is a unit of pressure. And over here we have another temperature. So if we've got two of those, one of those has to be T1 and the other one is T2. And we're asking for another pressure. And that right there is going to be P2, and this one is P1 over here. And that means we've got a couple of P's and a couple of T's. So if we didn't know we were in the Guy Lussac section, we would go, oh, okay, we need that equation where we've got P1 over T1 is equal to. P2 over T2. And then we're going to list our variables so we can keep our thoughts organized. And we have P1 is 200 Kelvin. Sorry, not Kelvin. Kilopascal. And T1 is 700 Kelvin. P2, what's that? We don't know, that's what we're looking for. And T2 is what? It's 295 Kelvin. So we need to rearrange the equation for P2 and we want to get it by itself. So that means we have to get rid of T2. And remember that variables can move diagonally across an equal sign that's completely legal. And that would give us P1 T2 over T1 is equal to P2. And most of us like to turn it around so that we have the variable that we're solving for on the left hand side. So just flip it around and put P1 T2. And right there, your brain's going to want to do P1 T1. It's going to want to keep this together, but you're going to want to make sure that you keep your one and your two where it's supposed to go because that's a common student mistake. Let me erase that over there in case I need the space. And then we're just going to plug and chug. So P1 is 200 kilopascal and T2 is 295 Kelvin. Now again, make sure your brain's not doing P1, T1 on the top there because it'll want to do this one and then that one because that seems to make sense to us. And T1 is 700 Kelvin. Now what cancels out? Kelvin. We have Kelvin on the top and we have Kelvin on the bottom and Kelvin divided by Kelvin is what? It's one. Anything divided by itself is one. So on the top, we have four sig figs here, three sig figs here, and on the bottom, we have how many? We have four sig figs there. So if we have four sig figs, three sig figs, and four sig figs, we're going to go with how many in the answer? Three, that's right. Okay, so whiz bam bing. We do this in our calculator and we get 84.3 kilopascal. So Jim Bob's engine was at 295 Kelvin and 84.3 kilopascal. And when he revved his engine, it heated up 
to 700 Kelvin and 200 kilopascal for the pressure. So that makes sense. When he heated it up, it went to a higher temperature and a higher pressure. Now, one thing that students always ask me is, wait, 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 wait. What happened here was Jim Bob actually started where the engine was 295 and we didn't know the pressure and then he revved his engine and we got 700 Kelvin and 200 kilopascal. So shouldn't 295 be T1 instead of T2 and the pressure that he started with, shouldn't that be P1? instead of the question mark there and shouldn't he have a temperature of 700 kelvin when he finishes this exercise in a pressure of 200 kilopascal yes you can do it that way too if you want to do it in order of time instead of how the uh, question reads. So most of us will go ahead and put these two first because um, they're first in the question. But if you're thinking he started out here and here, so we should call that P1 and T1. Yeah, you guys can do it that way too. You just want to keep the sets that are together. And what I mean is that at 700 Kelvin, you have a pressure of 200 kilopascal. So those two um, Numbers there, they need to be T1 and P1 or T2 and P2. You need to keep the set together. So I'm going to go ahead and solve this equation if we switch the sets around, just so you guys can see that it works either way. So if we go ahead and we say that P1 is the pressure that we're looking for, and T1 was 295 Kelvin because that's where his engine started. And then he revved it and it went up to 700 Kelvin and a pressure of 200 kilopascal. Well, now we're solving for P1. So if we rearrange the equation for P1, what we will get is that P1 is equal to P2 T1 over T2. And what I did was I kept P2 and T2 where they're at, and then I took T1 and I moved it diagonally across the equal sign because that's legal. And so if we fill in our numbers here, if we just plug and chug, we've got P2 is equal to what? 200 kilopascal and then we have T1 and T1 is 295 Kelvin and T2 right there that is 700 Kelvin and we can see that that's exactly the same as what we wrote up top there and so the Kelvin cancels out and we do the calculation on our calculator we get 84.3 kilopascal. So as long as you keep the measurements that go together together in a set, you're going to be fine. Okay, so today the barometer reads 750 millimeters of mercury and the thermometer says it's 65 degrees. If the barometer read 700 millimeters of mercury at 6 a.m., what can we approximate the temperature to have been at that time? Now, there's all kinds of other variables that go on here, but if we're just trying to solve it and be really simple, we'll go ahead and use Guy Lussac's law. And I'm going to switch back to blue because I like blue better. Okay, so we've got P1. T1, P2, and T2. So where did we start out? Well, it says today the barometer is 750 millimeters of mercury and the temp is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So those are the two uh, measurements that are first in the question. But if you're going by time, 
we have that the barometer was 700 millimeters of mercury and we're asking for the temperature. So either way, you guys, uh, let's go ahead and do what most people would do and say, okay, 750 millimeters of mercury is our first pressure because the barometer reads that and the thermometer says it's 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Boo! We're going to have to convert. And P2 is what? P2 at 6 a.m. was 700 millimeters of mercury. And T2, we're asking that question. What is T2? Okay, so if we go up here and we say we're going to have to use the same equation, we might want a little bit more room right here to do some algebra. So let me go ahead and write that again. So we have P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. And I need to solve for T2. And that one's kind of a pain because it's in the bottom, so I need to move it to the top, but then it's next to P1, and P1's going to have to move too, so I'm going to have to change colors on you. I'm going to have to take that one and move it down to where T2 was, and also that leaves T1 on the left-hand side, so let's go ahead and move T1 over here. Ah! But okay, we can handle it. So now we have T2 is equal to P2 times T1 divided by P1. And now we can throw some numbers into our equation after we go ahead and convert 65 degrees Fahrenheit to a temperature in Kelvin. Now you guys know how to do this on your own at this point, so I'm just gonna tell you that this is 18.3 degrees Celsius which is 291 Kelvin. So we're just going to plug and chug here. P2, we've got P2 at 700 millimeters of mercury. Oops, there's not a second M there. There we go. And T1, T1 is 291 Kelvin. Now remember, if you're doing P2, your brain is going to want to do T2 on the top there. But good thing in this question, we don't have a T2. We have a T1, so we'll fill that in there. And P1 is 750 millimeters of mercury. And what cancels out? millimeters of mercury. So our pressure unit cancels out and we're left with Kelvin, which is a temperature unit, which makes sense because we're solving for a temperature for T2. And if we put this into our calculator, what we're going to get is that T2 is 272 Kelvin. Now we don't wanna leave it there because the question gives us the temperature in Fahrenheit. So it expects us to return it in Fahrenheit. And what we'll find when we do the calculation is that 272 Kelvin is negative one degree Celsius because remember going back and forth between Kelvin and Celsius, you're gonna add 273 or subtract 273. And going from Kelvin to Celsius, it's subtract 273. So 272 minus 273 is negative 1 degree Celsius. And that gives us approximately 30 degrees Fahrenheit there. So it was a little bit below freezing uh, if all other conditions are working with us and uh, let us go ahead and solve this equation and then we move on to the combined gas law which will be in the next video so i will see you there bye bye